It's time to get started So take a seat It's the Science Cafe Brought to you by OEV The Science Cafe is a bunch of graduate students at UMass Amherst in biology um, trying to share with the community cool things about science. So we have here a professional, an expert in epigenetics, Dina. <laughs> Whoa, I don't know that I <laughs> <laughs> To help everybody understand the concept a little bit better and maybe share some exciting epigenetic facts with everybody. Um, so we do this once a month. The next one will be November 8th. Um, and those are our funding sources, by the way, that make this possible. So um, thank them. <laughs> and uh, if you want to do the science after dark fun um, after the semester meeting where we bring all everyone back, uh, the donations are in the back of the room. So yeah. welcome. Speaking in life. You haven't missed any science, don't worry. <laughs> so um, nice and graduated cylinder in the back. And uh, only if you're comfortable, donate. But that's for the art. Um, end of your celebration too will happen and uh, we're going to invite all of the speakers from the year. So if you want to continue the conversation please join us then, please join us after this cafe as well and um, ask questions at the uh, five minute question intervals where we invite everyone to clarify any concepts that you might have been confused about or any fun ideas that you had that maybe Dina would know something about. So she'll talk for um, 15 minutes, and then there'll be five minutes, and then that will happen three times tonight. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a sign-up sheet that's in the back. Please sign up. It'll be passed around. It will be passed around. Leon's supporting it right now. <laughs> um, and that's important so that we know who's here, so that we can get your email on the list, and that you can know when the next one's happening. November 8th. The next one's going to be really exciting, by the way, because we're going to do a fermented food festival afterwards. So stick around. Um, afterwards, we're going to have a, a few vendors from the area and uh, some samples for you guys to enjoy. And they're going to talk about um, the science behind how they ferment their food, and it should be really interesting. So that will happen after next week's cafe. Come on. Next month's cafe. <laughs> a little ambitious there. Um, okay, so please put down your Science Cafe suggestions also on the sign-up sheet so that we are actually talking about things that you guys are interested in um, because epigenetics are really cool and we think you guys might want to hear about it. So anyways, without further ado, give us feedback and suggestions for next week or for next month. But this week we are talking about epigenetics and that is the, how the environment uh, impacts and interacts um, our, with our genes to determine our personal qualities. So the first question would be, what is a gene? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what is a gene is one of those sort of deceptively simple questions. Everyone thinks they have a good idea of what it is until they actually get asked and put on the spot. Um, so the way that I define a gene is um, a portion of DNA that tends to be inherited together. Um, so we can think about genes as coding for a protein, and for the most part that's true, but there are also other types of genes that don't necessarily code for proteins. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the general idea, is it's a portion of DNA that, that tends to get inherited together and, and does something. So how is it inherited? Yeah, so there's contributions from your mom and your dad during fertilization, right? Um, during meiosis, you produce gametes that have half of the DNA of a normal adult cell, um, and that those two gametes come together, fuse during fertilization, and you have contributions from your mom and from your dad. Um, and during that process of producing gametes during meiosis, um, you can actually have recombination and crossing over that shuffles the genetic deck a little bit and, and gets things um, get some things happening, and that'll be important later on, so I just want to make a note of it now. Yeah, I think if that was confusing at all, we'll clarify it. <laughs> um, another thing that we might want to know is what a phenotype is. Yeah, and so a phenotype, as opposed to being the genetic contribution of what makes you you, 
your phenotype is your, your physical or behavioral traits that, that make up who you are and what you look like and how you act. Um, so, you know, you can think about a phenotype being, for example, your hair color or the shape of your nose. Um, those are some physical phenotypes, some, some morphological phenotypes. I also include behavior as a phenotype, um, which again isn't something that everyone always does, but that's, that's the way that my lab thinks about it. Um, and it's the way that I'm used to thinking about it. Um, and so your, your phenotype is influenced to one degree or another by your genes, right? Um, so that's, you know, how those things, at least from the beginning, start to interact. All right, so to bring it back to something that a lot of us probably have been experiencing recently, um, you probably have heard of 23andMe, that's getting really big right now. And a lot of people have been getting their genetics tested to find out, oh, I have the, the gene that means I could be uh, athletic or I could be really strong. And um, is there a role for the environment versus genes in these phenotypes? Yeah, absolutely. I don't like to think about it as you know, nature or nurture. I think about it as nature and nurture. Um, most of your traits are going to be determined by a combination of both genetic and environmental influences. Um, so the way I can kind of illustrate this is with an example, which is muscle development, like, like, we, like I've already alluded to. Um, so here you have four different animals that all share a um, mutation in a myostatin gene. And myostatin is a really important gene, obviously, for muscle development. Um, and so mutating it can lead to overproduction of muscle, like you see in these, these four animals. Um, and this mutation is actually evident really early on in development. Calves from those two bulls would, um, would actually show basically two times the muscle fibers and higher birth weights um, than their you know, unmutated uh, sibling, siblings. Uh, so, this clearly is a gene that has a very heavy impact on the phenotype, but other genes for muscle development don't have quite such a clear um, impact on the phenotype, and in fact, it uh, rely much more heavily on the environment, in that case, sort of your workout regimen, right? Um, and for a lot of animals, not humans necessarily, but for a lot of animals, your workout regimen is determined by how many predators you're experiencing in your environment, how often do you have to run away. Um, and so your, um, your environment in that situation is going to matter a lot. Um, and so, for example, if you have two bodybuilders build have a baby together, it's not necessarily that the baby's going to be totally jacked at birth, it's that <laughs> that baby probably has a higher potential of creating that kind of muscle mass over its development. So, how is it possible that an environmental factor could influence a baby? Yeah, so, sorry, I forgot to put up my hand. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the mechanistic side of things, how does it actually happen? We don't always know, but we have a couple of examples that we have worked out really well. Um, so, for example, we have these mice. Um, so these, uh, the, the yellow mouse carries a mutation and it's a goody gene. Um, and if you breed together two of those yellow mice, um, chances are you're going to get another fat yellow mouse. Um, and so the agouti gene carries with it this ravenous appetite that leads to um, being overweight. Um, it also leads to these mice being prone to cancer and diabetes. Um, and again, if you cross two of these things together, if you make them together, um, they're almost always going to give you a mouse that looks exactly like them. Um, the exception to that is actually the brown mouse on the right. Um, that brown mouse had a mom that looked like mom and a dad that looked like that yellow mouse, but it was its mother was fed something quite different from the other yellow mice. Um, and so, by changing mom's diet, we actually drastically changed the phenotype of the baby. Um, and so, the diet that we gave it not me, but um, researchers gave it, was very rich in methyl, methyl groups. Um, and methylation is what we typically lately have thought about when we talk about epigenetics, is um, this ability to turn off or on genes based on environmental factors, um, like how many methyl groups you, you encounter. Um, so methyl groups can attach to a gene and actually turn off its expression, and that's what happened here, is the um, methyl groups in the, in the mom's diet attached to the baby's genes and actually let it 
grow up somewhat normal. Um, and so where can we find methyl groups in things like onions, beets, and garlic, and also actually the supplements that we give to pregnant women. Um, and so these researchers also found that the percentage of how much methyl groups were in the diet um, actually led to a spectrum of phenotypes. And so giving it a completely methylated diet would, would lead to a brown mouse, and giving it completely unmethylated would lead to a yellow mouse, but there was actually a com complete spectrum in between. Um, so that's, that's one example of a um, really well worked out mechanism for how these kinds of changes, how these kinds of environmental influences um, change the phenotype. So would that mean that we're more susceptible to environmental influence when we're young? Um, I think everything's a little bit squishier when you're young. <laughs> uh, but I think that it's also really important to reiterate that these kinds of changes can carry out through, throughout your, the course of your life. Um, so adults can be susceptible to these kinds of changes as well. Um, but you know, when you're young, the pace of development is so much faster um, and so many more things are going on in terms of maturity and, and um, patterning of, of how you're gonna end up looking as an adult that yeah, I think we're a little bit more susceptible when we're young, but not completely unsusceptible when we're older. All right, we got a wild question now. <laughs> Does this mean that there's anything such as free will, or is everything determined by your genes? Your genes and your environment. <coughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I love to impress on my students that you know science and philosophy are super intertwined. You really wouldn't have modern scientific um, enterprise without philosophy. Um, and so I love this question because it, it brings us back to those roots, but honestly, I don't know <laughs> um, if we have free will or just the appearance of it because we don't know all of the causal factors, right? Um, but I think that even if we could perfectly predict the function of every gene and every environment and every genetic background, so that is like the influence of other genes on that gene's function, even if we had that, I still think there's a role for chance, and I still think there's a role for, for something other than those, those factors. Um, but are chance and free will really the same thing? I, I honestly can't tell you. That's not my, my area of expertise. And thank goodness we don't know everything, because that gives us a job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does anybody have questions about this first section? Yes? Yeah. So can the brown mouse turn into a yellow mouse by changing? Diet. No, usually methylation is pretty permanent, um, as far as I know, yeah. That's interesting. And, and those changes will actually carry on throughout um, subsequent generations as well, so the brown mouse will not give birth to a, to a yellow mouse no matter what its diet is. Um, yeah, great question. Any other questions? Yeah. So are methyl groups like common in people's diets? Yeah. If you eat onions and beets, not everybody does. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of restrictions on women's diets when they're pregnant. Does that have anything to do with some of those effects? Oh boy. Uh, I'm honestly, sorry. No, I think people like telling pregnant women what to do. <laughs> but I'm not even going to touch that. Okay. <laughs> So you said a brown mouse won't be able to give birth to a yellow mouse no matter what it eats. Why is it that it can go in one direction but it can't go in the other direction? Yeah, methyl groups, what they do is they block the, you know, the machinery of, of turning the gene into a protein from actually accessing the gene. And so once it's blocked, it's pretty well blocked. Um, and those, those kinds of things can last for several generations. I don't know exactly when it begins to wear out. I think it does eventually. but. At least in the short term, that's a that's a permanent um, thing. Do we have one more question? Yeah. So, were you trying to say there? I'm confused, but um, the brown mouse isn't affected by its diet. It's affected by what it inherited because of the parents' diet. Yeah. Okay. I think we have time for one more example. If yeah, I forgot about Daphne. Um, <laughs> what, what my lab likes to call fish food. Um, Daphne are little water fleas, um, so they live in the water column in like lakes and things like that. Um, and the 
Um, what I'm showing you here are two different species of Daphnia that are marked at the bottom. Um, and each, within each species, those are genetically identical clones. Um, so there, there is no genetic difference between those, those two very different looking uh, animals. And the only difference is whether they were raised in an environment with cues from predators. Um, and so if you have cues from a predator, you look like this guy on the left, um, you have spines and a helmet, um, <laughs> things that make you able to survive predators. Um, if you're on the right, you were uh, raised in an environment with no predators and you, you know, don't produce those, those structures. Um, so again, that's, that's one where we're, we have the mechanism fairly well worked out where we at least know that it's these chemical cues coming off of the predators that induce that response. If that makes sense, we'll move on to the next topic. We want to know what plasticity is. Yeah, so, so a lot of these things that we've been talking about are, are plastic responses, right? Um, and certainly this Daphnia uh, response is a plastic response um, where you have a single genotype that is able to give rise to multiple phenotypes just based on what environment it's raised on. Um, so this is a really easy case where there's just two phenotypes, one or the other, it's, it's a binary switch. Um, my lab's more interested in things that are continuous. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, I'll leave it there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then how do we measure it? Yeah, we measure it um, using something called a reaction norm. Um, so I think that's the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. So again, here you have two different environments, and you have your trait on the y-axis and your environments on the x. And um, in one environment, your trait looks this way, and in the other environment, you have a very different uh, trait value. And so that to us is a plastic response and a pretty drastic one. Um, the alternative, right, is that you have no plastic response um, and you look the same no matter what environment you're raised in. Um, and so our lab is really interested in how you go from those two states. Um, can you become um, more plastic or less plastic and what are the genes that allow you to become more plastic or less plastic? So, so there's no data here. This is just this is yeah. This is a hypothetical. Help us understand, but then why why is this important? Um, <laughs> why is this important? Because plasticity is um, really useful if you're encountering a novel environment, right? So if you're if you're moving into a new place where you don't know what the environment is going to be, the ability to to look either way can actually be quite useful because it can allow you to survive that novel condition. Um, similarly, if you have a, a stable but fluctuating environment, so something like a seasonal change that occurs over and over again predictably, um, being plastic can allow you to get through that seasonal change without um, too much trouble. So for example, like uh, you can think about your pet every season, uh, uh, sorry, every winter it grows a new coat. Um, and, it, and that enables it to be warm throughout the winter and then it sheds that coat in the summer because it doesn't need that, that heat capacity. So it sounds like plasticity is a really awesome thing. It's good for us. Yeah, it can be, absolutely. Yeah, are there, are there costs to being plastic? Of course there are. I mean, we'll all be you know, perfectly plastic for everything, and we're not. Um, so the costs for being plastic um, involve, we think, um, things like the, the time and effort and resources it takes to build the structures that enable us to be plastic, um, to build the structures that sense the environment, to build the actual structures once you have sensed the environment and know that you need to build a new structure, um, like the, the Daphnia example I was giving you. Um, if there's no need to build that structure, why waste the calcium or why waste the resources on it? Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the, the idea for what's costly about plasticity. Um, do we have data to support that? A little bit. Um, it's one of those things that's kind of hard to test, um, but there is an uh, experiment with snails where plastic snails had a lower growth rate than um, non-plastic snails. A growth rate or a growth rate? Growth rate. Growth rate. Growth rate. Well, yeah, they were slower growing. Um, so then are all organisms equally plastic if there's like a sweet spot? <laughs> Um, no, not all organisms are equally plastic, and that's actually, you know, the, sort of the driving factor behind the research that I've been doing is that 
we have um, two species of fish, because that's the what my lab studies. I forgot that those videos aren't going to play if I don't press play. Um, yeah, that's great. Our, our audience volunteer. Um, so, so the environmental factor that we're interested in is the diet that they're they're eating, and actually, it's not so much what their diet consists of, but how it's presented to them. So, these fish are benthic. Um, these guys are eating off of rocks, off of the benthic substrate at the bottom of the lake, um, and so, yeah, that puts a different um, environment than if they're swimming around in the water column. Um, eating things out of the, the water column, sort of hunting and chasing down prey in the water column, and so those those guys are pelagic. Um, and yeah, benthic and pelagic is just the, the different way of eating. Uh, if you're eating off of rocks or if you're eating from the water column, um, and so actually the the two sets of fish that you were looking at here are the exact same species. They're just changing their behavior based on what environment they're encountering, um, and those behavioral changes come along in, in release <coughs> with a suite of morphological um, changes, and we can see that here. Um, so the, the ones that are plastic are on the bottom, um, and they're changing the slope of their, of their, you know, their face, they're, they're changing some things about their jaws and the way that their face is shaped based on what they're eating. The guys up top aren't actually changing at all. Um, you can put them in either environment and they're not going to do, they're going to behave differently, but they're not going to change their shape at all. And that's because they're different species. They, they are, are different species. species, yeah. And they're not choosing to change though, right? No, we're forcing them into it. <laughs> the environmental influence? Exactly. All right. Those were my questions, but do you guys have questions? <laughs> yeah. So are those sorts of characteristics inheritable? Because it seems like this is sort of like a way to sort of fast forward evolution. Yeah. Like used to say, oh, well, giraffes have a long neck because they stretched over the years from reaching for the trees. Like, right. no, the short neck of giraffes die. So that's a species evolving over a long time. This sounds like it's sort of like a way of speeding that up within one generation. It, it absolutely is. And that's, that's one of the benefits to plasticity, right, is that it allows you to get to change within a single generation as opposed to waiting for evolution. But the nice thing about plasticity is because it's also inheritable, because things that are plastic, um, there's inheritable components of that plasticity, um, it can actually lead to evolution in the long term as well. And They're we think that's kind of happening. happening at the same time. Yeah. It's like evolution gets all the credit, and nobody <laughs> really knows about this. Evolution has traditionally gotten all the credit. My, my life at least in the last couple hundred years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and honestly, there's a, there's a big conversation happening in, in my field right now about you know what how how important are these epigenetic factors to evolution um, and you know what side I come down on <laughs> and that's why we have the cafe because it is important and we got to get the word out <laughs> yeah if you had one type of fish in one environment and they adapted and were behaving one certain way would they if you put them in the other environment would they adapt to the way that they behave, or would they still behave the same way that they did when they adapted to the first one? That is a great question. Um, I suspect, we haven't actually done it, but I suspect that the ones that are changing would change back. Um, and the ones that aren't changing morphologically obviously aren't going to do anything. Behaviorally, they will switch between the two. Yeah, it just depends on what they're seeing. Believe it or not, fish are pretty smart. <laughs> Yeah. Are there, so are there any genetic differences between these two, the benthic and the pelagic? Between the benthic and the pelagic, no. So within a species, the genetic background is about the same. So what's different? So the environment's different than what's changing. Um, like what? I guess I'm confused about what the mechanism is that causes those changes if the genes are the same. Well, so within you know, within your body, you have things that sense your environment. Right? And so that's, that's what we're talking about, is it's upregulating some genes and downregulating other genes based on what you're encountering in your environment. But they have the same genes. They have the same potential, basically. Yeah? Do you have any sense of scale? Um, is there 10,000 epigenetic sites that can be triggered by different environmental factors? Or oh. each species would have two or three that are essential? That is a great question. I can tell you that 
at least in the research that we've been doing, we keep getting one hit coming up over and over again, but we do have other hits as well. So it's, it, you know, I, I would say it's more than two or three, but less than 10,000, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> of the two, that it's not one or the other. Um, yeah, that's the best answer. I'm not a microbiome person by any stretch of the imagination. I think it's cool, but I don't know that much about it. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk about something you do know then. So <laughs> we've talked about plasticity, we've talked about genes, and we've got this model graph that you showed before. Um, so what role do genes actually play in plasticity? Yeah, so like I was talking about, not all, not all organisms are equally plastic. Um, so we know based on that, that plasticity has evolved the same way that other traits have evolved. Um, and if it's evolved, there's a heritable component to it, there's probably a gene behind it, and, and my lab set out a long time before I ever joined the lab to find those genes. Um, and so that's kind of been the basis of, of what we've been doing in our lab for the past probably decade or so. <laughs> So what, what is that? I mean, if there's a heritable component, like what does it look like? Yeah, um, you know, we didn't really know, and so we set out to find it. Um, and so this is where things get, um, we're gonna go back to that recombination idea from before. Um, so if you take two parents that look different, and you meet them together, and you produce offspring, they're gonna have an intermediate genotype and probably an intermediate phenotype. Um, and if you cross those guys together, so you mate siblings from that, that first set of, um, uh, that first generation, and you cross those guys together, you can take a look at all of the, those hybrids, and because of recombination, bits of mom's genome is gonna be stuck up next, again, next to bits of dad's genome. Um, you're shuffling the deck, basically. And the idea between what we do in our lab is we actually go through and we scan the genome at multiple places and say, okay, what's your, what's your phenotype? If you're an individual, what's your phenotype? And then are there any places where there's a strong association between the genotype and the phenotype? Where if you have two, you know, two contributions from your mom, you look like your mom. If you have two contributions from your dad, you look like your dad. And if you're intermediate, you're intermediate. Um, and so, Lucky for us, we did find such a place, both, or such a yeah, such a place both in you know this hypothetical example and in the real world data that, that my lab has collected. Um, and so for us, that's a that's a place where we think, okay, there's likely a gene here that's controlling whatever trait we're looking at. And in our case, it's that ability to be plastic. Um, so that's all correlative. We actually wanted to be able to go in and test for that that gene's involvement. And that's what, where sort of my piece of the puzzle came in. All right, so you found, you managed to find it. Yeah. How did you test its involvement in plasticity? Yeah, so what I did was I actually went in, um, and what we were looking at was specifically bones and, and skeletal structures. And so we went in and we wanted to look at how much bone was being deposited in a given amount of time. And so what we did is, this is really slick, technique. Um, first, we took our fish, they were siblings, we split them into their various treatments, uh, like I talked about before, the, different, the two different diets. Um, and then after we gave them some time to acclimate, we actually injected them with a dye, um, like a red dye right here. We waited some amount of time for them to be remodeling their bone and, and doing their thing. We injected them with, 
another color dye, so we injected them with green dye. We let them grow out for another week or so, and then we sacrificed them. Um, how, how do you inject a fish? Oh, with much difficulty. Um, <laughs> no, you, you put them to sleep first. Um, they're, they're totally out. They don't feel the pain. They just, um, you kind of put them belly up in a sponge. <laughs> um, and you take a syringe and you just kind of, like a medical syringe, just sterilize it and all that kind of thing and, and just inject them um, with the dye through their stomach. Um, so it then gets absorbed up into their bones from there. Um, so after we sacrificed them, we um, dissected off some of the bones. And the one in particular that I'm going to be talking about is sort of this interopical um, that's shaded in blue right there. This one? It's called the interopical. Um, but basically, it's just one of the bones in your face that determines um, you know, how, how well you can eat different diets. <laughs> um, and so then, because of the way that this dye works, I had to actually dissect off all of the like soft tissue and everything. Um, and then I took some images, and you can see there's really nice labels, um, red and green, and that gave me the, the ability to count how much, um, or measure how much bone was deposited during the course of the experiment. So I did this for each treatment, and then I compared the treatments, and I got those same reaction marks that we were looking at before. So in one environment, um, this species has one trait value, and the other environment, this species has another trait value. Um, then I looked at a second species, and we don't actually see a significant difference between the traits, um, sorry, between the environments. Um, so that reaction one flattens back out, which looks a lot like the, the hypothetical <laughs> um, example that I gave at the beginning. So you injected both of them the same way, yep. and the only difference is the time. The so the green just happened later. Well, no, actually. So the only difference is, is the, the diet. So how much bone they were putting down depended on which diet they were in. Um, and so they were actually given the exact same amount of time. They were sacrificed on the same day and the experiment started on the same day. It was just, you know, were they depositing more bone or less bone um, in, in a given environment? And for one species, it changed how much bone it was depositing based on the environment it was in. And the other one, it wasn't plastic. It didn't change how much bone it was depositing. Yeah, I just meant between the red and the green. I should have been more specific. Yeah, but the red, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All right, did anybody else have questions about that? Um, maybe that was just me. So, Actually, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I was a little confused about the red and green, too. So why exactly were you interested in seeing the time lapse of the dip bone deposition? Like, what was the point of so it's not so much about the time. The time was just we were giving them time to actually eat the different diets and then change their shape based on that. So that's why we gave them time to grow up. Um, and so the whole idea here is that you know they're constantly depositing bone and putting down bone based on what they're eating. Um, and one species changed how fast it was depositing bone based on what environment it was in, and the other species did not. Does that make more sense? Yeah. All right. So, wait, did you have a question? No. No. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Just to kind of like repeat and confirm. So, is it the red bone and it's like the starting bone that both of them have the same, and then like the green bone is like the new stuff that some of them grew a lot of, and then the others? Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. I think we're on the same page now. <laughs> All right, so what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> All that really tells us is exactly what we knew at the beginning, is that these two species have different amounts of plasticity. One of them is very plastic, one of them is not very plastic. Um, but they're also different at that gene that I was talking about. And what we wanted to do from there was actually go in and, and really test that gene um, and say, okay, well, all of this is correlative, um, but can we actually show that this, this gene causes a change in the amount of, you know, the amount that they're changing between the environments? And so that's the next step of the experiment. And, and we did the exact same thing um, in a different type of fish that's more genetically tractable. Um, 
And what we saw here is, again, in the, in the ones we didn't do anything to, there was a plastic response. When we actually knocked down that gene, that plastic response went away. And when we knocked up that gene, that plastic response got way more drastic. Let's knock down and knock up gene. Yeah. <laughs> knock down means we basically didn't let it be expressed. It still existed, but it wasn't turned on as, as much as it was in the other fish. And knock up is the reverse, where it's more turned on. Was yeah. there any change in their actual diet? I mean, did what could the deposition be because of a change in what they were eating? Or it was you made sure they had the same, they were eating the same thing? They were eating the same, and actually their growth more. rates were the same. Um, so they were growing the, the same. They were just changing how much bone they were depositing in their face. Yeah. And that was based on just the quantity in increase in diet? Just the change in, in the, the way that the diet was presented to them. So it wasn't, it wasn't quantity. They were given the exact same amount of food and the exact same composition of food. It was just whether it was put on a rock or sprinkled for them to, to suck out of the water column. Yeah. So how hard was it to target the gene and turn it on? I actually didn't have to do any of that because, <laughs> because zebrafish, there, there is a whole host of people, we were talking about this earlier, there's a whole host of people who love to, to make weird zebrafish mutants and we just bought it off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are also regulations about that. There are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, even if you're really interested, I don't think you can just buy no, one. But because we're a research lab with a legitimate purpose, we are able to buy this. <laughs> just to clarify. <laughs> intermediate between pelagic and benthic, so you can test the hypothesis whether those are really straight lines connecting them. I mean, or is that a, a reason, is a reasonable assumption? I mean, it could be doing anything between pelagic and benthic, right? It doesn't have to be a straight line. I mean, yeah, it doesn't have to be a straight line. That's true. Um, we, we have given them a choice between the two diets before, and we haven't really done much with that data at this point. <coughs> and, but it does exist out, out in the Albertson lab space somewhere. There is a bunch of fish that were given the option of either being benthic or, or pelagic, but we haven't really done much with anything in between, um, necessarily, yeah. So these are just based on theory, but it should be a straight line. Yeah. Yep. I just wondered if that gene and that plasticity is served across amphibians and reptiles and mammals, and if there are implications for osteoporosis in the work that you're doing. Yeah, there, there are um, implications for osteoporosis. One of the other genes that we found that's related to this plastic response that I haven't done a whole hell of a lot with yet is a um, cilia mutant, actually. And so cilia's, ciliopathies are, are you know, bone degenerative kind of things. Um, so I haven't gotten too, too much into that, but it's definitely a direction that the lab is taking. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about stuff that's um, super reversible and malleable, like like camouflaging or something like that? Is that considered plasticity or is it since it's not really genetic changes, but rather, I, I don't really know. What is, like, how is camouflage and that type of thing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I consider it to be plasticity. I, I delineate, I guess, between reversible and irreversible and all that kind of thing, but, but I all see it under the broad um, umbrella of plasticity. Um, does that <coughs> kind of answer your question? Yeah, I guess what, is there a main difference I'm just thinking about like the mechanisms, like there's the, it's like a, an octopus that's changing color. It's not really changing its genes or anything, is it? Like in that moment, it's not expressing anything differently, but it's still drastically changing its right. phenotype. So is there like, what's the? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair difference is that, you know, is it upregulating or downregulating genes? No, well, it's, it's a slightly different form of plasticity, but I still okay. see it as plasticity. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. 
Do we know uh, specifically what modality of the new behavior that is triggering the plasticity? So for example, if an animal is feeding from the rock, is it scraping its face against the rock and that's what's triggered? Or just yeah. visual? visual or no, exactly. It's, it's, it's pressing its face up against the rock and, and that's <laughs> causing it to deposit more bone because it's kind of smushed up against there. So back to osteoporosis. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> if you suddenly were told you had osteoporosis, how would you start eating your meals? <laughs> <laughs> I would talk to my doctor. <laughs> yeah, just don't eat on rocks. <laughs> um, or do. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not particularly up on the medical li literature, so I, I, I personally don't know how I would handle that situation, but definitely start by talking to your physician. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have that problem yet either. That's <laughs> good. All right, so we have a big ultimate takeaway. What is the actual yeah. thing? Well, what, what's my takeaway from this is that there are genes that control our ability to be plastic. Um, plasticity takes a variety of forms, but it's, it's usually um, important to an animal's survival. Um, and you know, our ability to find and manipulate the genes that, that enable us to be plastic um, is, is interesting and, and novel and something that we haven't done before, really. So we can manipulate stuff. We can totally, I mean, I didn't want to <laughs> We can find it, we can manipulate it. It's pretty cool. Thanks. Does anybody <laughs> else have questions about it? I kind of deviated from the format because I thought this was interesting. But you can now ask anything about what was discussed. I've, I've, yeah. Are humans plastic and like, what's an example of a human plastic trait? Yeah, um, absolutely. Humans are totally plastic, right? Um, so to relate to the research that I've been doing, um, different kinds of athletes remodel their bones differently, and we can find those markers. If you've ever watched the show Bones, you know that there's a lot about, about um, markers for different activities. Um, is this person a dancer? And you can actually see that reflected on their bones and their muscles. Um, I think more than, than being sort of physically plastic like that, morphologically plastic, I think humans are incredibly behaviorally plastic. To go back to another example I brought up earlier, you know, your, your dog or your cat shedding its coat, we don't shed our coats, we put on jackets or take them off based on how hot or cold we are. So we're not changing our traits, but we are changing our behavior in response to environmental stimuli. Yeah. I have two questions that are related. <laughs> okay. okay, so the first question, in this gene that you found that controls plasticity and a morphological trait, you, it was nice that there was like one gene that would do that. For plasticity, like in many other things that organisms do, whether it's like physiological, morphological, behavioral, it's probably not always just one gene that's controlling plasticity, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, probably not. So. If we were to manipulate it, is it basically only as easy as like how complex that control is? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> so one of the things I didn't talk too much about is that this, like I said, this gene has come up in a couple of different traits, all related to this diet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's probably suites of traits that are controlled by <laughs> one or a few loci, um, one or a few genes, but yeah, I don't think we know enough about the genes that make up plasticity to really know, for sure, yeah. Okay, and then my other question. <laughs> so I work on fish and climate change, and so like everything is changing really fast right now, mm -hmm. and one of the big questions is like, are animals gonna be able to adapt to climate change fast enough? Yeah. So if we find that there's some recognizable gene that helps an animal be more plastic dealing with temperature and we could potentially manipulate it. Like, do you think that would actually work? I don't know, but I think it's worth a shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things that is, is scary about climate change, right, is that it's happening really fast and, and our organism's gonna be able to evolve fast enough and 
plasticity, like, like we talked about earlier, can help circumvent some of that, but the extent to which it can, can get around it and, and the extent to which we can you know, know enough in time to actually be able to help, I don't know. <laughs> Is there a single organism or um, type of like, I don't know if it's like a fish that um, grows faster to be able to change faster than all the other organisms? Um, I don't think, you know, every, everything is kind of a, a compromise between a lot of different things. And so if you had one thing that was growing faster than everything else, it was going to completely dominate that environment. And we don't see that in, in real life very much, so. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Maybe I should understand this, but I don't. Is it just that you were looking at that bone in the jaw that it laid down more calcium? Or would you have found that in the tailbone as well? That it was that the fish that was more plastic was laying down more calcium? Mm -hmm. Um so it was laying down more bone, not necessarily more calcium. I wanna be careful about that, but we looked only at things in the jaws. Um, because so then that changes the thought a little bit on osteoporosis. Um, it, it seems to lead more to stressing your bones that will help delay osteoporosis as opposed to just this one look at plasticity. Right. And I, I will say that I lied a little bit. Well, I was wrong a little bit. Um, we did look at their, at their scales because that was a really good internal control that we don't think their scales should be changing based on what environment they're in. And what we found is actually that they were similar across the environments, no matter which species we were talking about. Um, so there, there was a little bit of that where it's, it's localized to this, this, the face um, more so than anything else. Yeah. Um, one question I have is the relationship between like being able to pass the gene down and plasticity. So like if camouflages or the octopus or whatever, um, how is that, how is that, like the fish, could they pass that to the next generation? So the idea with plasticity is that plastic fish um, will, will have offspring that are plastic and non-plastic fish will have offspring that are not plastic. Does that answer your question? Oh, so, so the actual ability is what's Right, there. yeah, exactly. So is it like they pass down their plasticity, but then the child gets to choose yeah. to be plastic in a different way? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a time when plasticity will like go to fixation? Like, like if that if like generation after generation of those fish were in the benthic environment and <coughs> this thing, that that would like stop being plastic, where it wouldn't be able to go back the other way. That's the idea. Um, I don't. It's it's hard to prove that totally, um, but. There's a, there's a whole set of research called the flexible stem model of evolution that, that is that idea exactly, yeah. So you would consider that um, a mutilation at some point of an organism's life uh, is, uh, could be um, a phenotypic plasticity event for a new environment, for instance, Having a methylation that is hard to undo and compared to, let's say, the same adaptation that would occur for something like microRNAs that would interfere with the gene expression. Yeah, I think methylation is kind of its own, I don't, I don't know that it fits under the category of plasticity, to be totally honest. Um, I'd have to think more about that, but yeah, does that answer your question a little bit? Do you know if, um, because they're laying down the bone in the jaw in certain places, is there bone that's being taken away or deprived of in other, like in the other jaw bones or elsewhere in the body? I don't think so. Okay, do you, sorry, follow up then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know if uh, there's any more like absorption of calcium or other nutrients that are required for bone formation? in the, the benthic versus the pelagic to be able to lay that down? We haven't looked at it okay. specifically, yeah. But that's a great question. Yeah, a quick question. On the, uh, do you use some kind of modification of the number of methyl groups in a particular area? Or can you 
build it like a methylone to predict. Um, I'm pretty sure people are trying to do that right now. Yeah, not me. But, but like, <laughs> not me. Any more questions? You want to talk about like butterflies or something? Give us another example. I'm great. I'm, I'm all sorry. Right. Well then, I want to thank Dina not only for this wonderful Science Cafe, but also for being a previous Science Cafe president. Not all of you probably know that she has led this organization to be as fruitful as it currently is, so we really appreciate her and all of her contributions to Science Cafe. You guys are making me um, and, <laughs> and we want to wish her good luck and good science in her endeavors at the, at this winter, moving to the West Coast mm -hmm. to study in Canada and California. Thank you guys so much. It's been fun. We get started, so take a seat. It's the Science Cafe brought to you by